Hey everybody, how you guys doing? I'm Eric Erlock and this is another talk on Buddhist philosophy and specifically the Zen Koan collection of the Blue Cliff Record, a text which I was first introduced to in college as an undergrad and I have loved it very much ever since. As I have mentioned a bit, I got very into Joshu, and from him only recently I got into Lin Ji, which I did several talks on, please look into those, but before I was even into Joshu, which I found through the, sh through the same uh, Shambhala publishings of Thomas Cleary and crew, J.C. Cleary, Thomas Cleary, etc., that their work and uh, Thomas Cleary's work through Shambhala and other, uh, well, yes, Shambhala and Thomas Cleary are both amazing. The Blue Cliff Record is one of the most impressive religious and philosophical documents in human history, one of them, especially in Eastern Asian and Chinese philosophy, and particularly in Zen Buddhism, although the more famous is the shorter collection that comes a hundred years later, known in English as the Gateless Gate. We're going to do one final talk for Buddhist philosophy this semester on the Gateless Gate next, but I am going to cover in this talk the cases of the Blue Cliff Record, which we have not fumbled our way already through in the last couple of talks. So please watch the last couple of talks on Zen Buddhism, and we're going to get right into it here with the Blue Cliff Record and some of the cases that we haven't covered. Because with Joshu and Linji, as already mentioned, there's been a couple of them. And we will listen to the soothing sounds outside as we do so. Which are hopefully, again, like mortal life, intermittent. And there you have it. So the Blue Cliff Record, which was uh, compiled and written around 1125, so the Renaissance of Europe is getting going mid-1400s, 1500s, in the Song Dynasty of China, which is very much the Chinese earlier Renaissance, the Tang leading into the brief period leading into the, between the two leading into the Song Dynasty. During the Song Dynasty, which was going on in the year 1000, 1100, 1200 in China, the Blue Cliff Record is the second most popular in Central Koan collection after the Gateless Gate from 1228. The Blue Cliff Record has 100 koans, 100 court cases for judgment and puzzles to figure out of human behavior and philosophical interaction, 82 of which were taken from the earlier transmission of the lamp, which was uh, compiled in 1004. Yuan Wu composed the Blue Cliff Record at Blue Cliff Cloister of Ying Chuan uh, Temple near the Blue Cliff Springs, famous for pure, pure waters used in tea. Taking koan cases, questions and comments from his lectures he gave between 1111 and 1112. What he called, in his words, Yuan Wu's words, turnabout chan. We had the turning word. If, if someone can say a turning word, as Nansen says, perhaps Joshu could have saved that cat. The turnabout chan, turnabout words of Zen, which allows the wise, the, in his words, sage and a half. I have remarked, well, isn't that a bee and a half, you know, uh, trying to be civil here. And so a sage and a half, the sage who is uh, for Lin Ji in and out of the holes of your face, and then it's a sage and a half. My, isn't wisdom wisdom and a half? I sure think it is. Well, it's just wisdom. Truth is truth, truth and a half. <laughs> it's a great saying. That the sage and a half freely and instantaneously changes directions between anything and any situation. Yuan Wu tells us this in the intro before the cases. So he is framing it in ways that then we've already had Lin Ji lecturing at length about. Yuan Wu says in, in, in the introduction to the first case, and he provides an introduction to each case, and then he provides poetry verses that he has selected to frame all of this, which further either continues each theme or throws it back on its head, which he is free to do. And you can see the commentators on each of these cases, like questioning exactly what they think you're going to think and throwing it back at you, which is, of course, Zen masters following Zen masters following Zen masters in not following, following, not following freely, like Water Buffalo of the Joshu, as mentioned. The water ox, as it were. 
Yuan Wu says in the introduction to the first case, quote, being shown one corner and finding the other three, sizing up fine grains and lead weights with a glance, all this is the tea and rice of patch-robed monks. Now, Lin Ji, this guy is of uh, post Lin Ji's house style Chan Zen, which is the hip house in the song. And Yuan Wu is technically not of Lin Ji's house, but he is then going to be published and helped by Lin Ji's house to come up with this text. And his house is, I believe, the Fa Yan school uh, house being incorporated into the other Zen Buddhist schools. That being shown one corner and finding the other three would be very much Nagarjuna. If you are throw, shown one X, Y, or Z, you should be able to freely play with X, not X, X and not X, and neither X nor not X, and know that's all in an X, potentially. Which is very much spelled out by Nagarjuna, Taoist teachings, and also a lot of Buddhist teachings, and then Chan behavior... Perhaps behavioral problems, yes, each and every koan case, as psychologists might tell us, is that all of this is the bread and butter, the tea and rice of poor patch-robed monks. And if you remember, Linji in the very beginning says this patch-robed stupid monk in that lump of red flesh, patchy, blotchy red flesh of yours, is the sage, and here a sage and a half, coming in and out of the holes of your face and everybody in these cases. Just free-flowing, back and forth, forth to back, doesn't care. It follows Nagarjuna's Katascoti with the being one corner and finding the other three. You then have Zhuangzi Taoist language, the second patriarch of Taoism, sizing up fine grains and lead weights with a glance. Now, I do know that that is not only Zhuangzi-like language, that is also language of Taoists who had court favorability, as later Taoists uh, popular in the Tang, which is the period Chan, Zen, is coming about, and there's more popular Buddhist schools, it talks very Taoist and then becomes the most popular Buddhist school, and possibly, very overtly, the most Taoist, from the Tang to the Song. Sizing up fine grains and lead weights with a glance is a wonderful way of summing up several of the Taoist teachings in a phrase, with a glance, that you can hear in several of my talks about Taoism. That if you glance at a situation, you should be developed enough of mind and peaceful enough of mind and competent enough of mind that you can see the tips of hairs in a puddle. Uh, Tong Taoist, I am forgetting precisely who, uh, said that you should be able to look in a reflecting pool and see each whisker. I believe that's even Zhuang Tzu, and then the Tong Taoist takes the language even further. I'll have to watch my own talks, figure out what I thought about it. That if you look at each and every whisker of the face, because your mind's still enough, you should be able to size up the small and insignificant and the large and weighty with just a glance. If you're paying more attention to people or to situations, you should be able to size them up like a crack of lightning before others. Taoists were talking these ways long before the, Bo the Zen Buddhists are playing with sudden and gradual enlightenment. All of this is just bread and butter for all of us poor, simple, stupid, uh, Taoist kind of tricksterish Zen monks. If we have four overlapping positions available in every situation, then we are free to move no matter how we are boxed in if we are unstuck. And one of the things I actually have been mentioning a lot, and one of the central ideas I'm fixed on now, is especially how semantics involves not only the good and the bad, but the tense and the calm. And the tense and the calm have to do with importance and unimportance, like sizing up fine grains or lead weights. If something's a lead weight in the room, that doesn't tell you it's a good or a bad lead weight. So good and bad and weighty and light. Weighty and light would be something like, not exactly corresponding to, something like tense or calm. Although, again, there's all sorts of combinations of feeling this out with people. So something like the weighty in the room or the unimportant. If people are all looking at each other with concern and you don't know why, you know there's something in the room important, but you don't know what it is yet and can't see it, but you can see plenty in the glances between people. Edgar Allan Poe suggests with his proto-Sherlock Holmes, Sherlock Holmes detective Dupont, that if you just look at people's faces or if you're feeling out the victim's feelings, you can size up the room better than the cops and all of their sciences. 
And that's if you use a little bit of empathy and are thus a true genius. Here, definitely you have the Taoists would have you glance at people's faces, as would the Zen Buddhists, and be able to size up people in a glance or two is definitely koan practice. And this is just bread and butter for the patrobe monks of Linji's house. We've already covered many of the Blue Cliff Record 100 Gong On cases. The first case is Bodhidharma arriving in China and upsetting Emperor Wu. Now, why would that case be put first? Because the House of Fayan folded, being folded into the House of Linji is publishing a work connecting Buddha to Bodhidharma and onward. Zhao Zhou's Picking and Choosing is the second case of the text. This is Picking and Choosing, and this is Clarity as soon as there are words. So what does that tell you without words, beyond the words? Mazu's Sun-Faced Buddha is the third. Mazu's Dying Verse. It's good to have dying poetry if you are a famous Zen monk, or at least they say you said that. And it's rather poetic justice in your patriarchal case. Mazu's sun-faced Buddha, moon-faced Buddha means, ah, you know, how are you doing? Ah, long time, short time, death, you know, dies. Uh, it doesn't just say, uh, yeah, it does, you know, right here on the wall uh, for the Holy Grail. And uh, short time thonk, you know. Uh, is it hot in here? In the 12th case, a monk asks Tung Shan, what is Buddha? And Tung Shan says three pounds of hemp which is very similar to Shaosho, saying, where does the way, which is very Taoist language, but then Buddhist Zen language and Buddhist language in China, where does the way return to? Um, well, I made a seven-pound hemp shirt, uh, is what he says. Three pounds of hemp, seven-pound hemp shirt are extraordinarily similar answers. And it is, what is Buddha? Where is the way? And then it's uh, three pounds of hemp, seven-pound hemp shirt. And... Zhao Zhao's seven-pound hemp shirt happens to be the 45th case of these hundred cases. So, in fact, if you wanted those compared, a couple pounds of hemp, I like to remind my students here in Berserkly land that neither of these, be, there's no evidence, again, that they either Pearson smoked the hemp shirt, you know, which is possibly legal in this town. I'm not sure. I don't check the zoning permits. But, yeah, that wouldn't have helped. And, in fact, of course, there's nothing left of this, so perhaps, you know, that would be evidence enough of a crime. I don't know. Uh, is no evidence evidence of a crime? If people are sneaky, it always is. So, and they're so intelligent, too, at hiding everything. I don't trust truth or reality at all. I have no idea why, after thousands of years of science. So, Mazu, twisting Bai Zong's nose after ducks flew away, which we already had, well, the sound has flown away. No, sound hasn't flown away. Pull it out of you right here. Is the 53rd case. Nanchuan, Nansen, killing the cat is case 63. And Zhao Zhou walking out with a sandal on his head after hearing about case 63 is the following case 64. Will you need me when this is all that ancient and medieval? So, in the 17th case... And now what we're going to do thus is we're going to cover a couple of cases here in order of the text, in fact, which is not entirely thematic, but I'm going to cover a couple of cases here in this talk, and we're going to cover the uh, several, not all of them, again, not going to exhaust either the meaning of any single case or the entire work, but there's a couple of these that interrelate with a lot of what we've been talking about that I want to cover. And again, that hopefully leaves open more for talking about all of this in the future. So in the 17th case, a monk asked, what is the meaning of the patriarch coming from the West? Here again, why did Baudrillard, 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 oh, that's Baudrillard, the French philosopher, as a patriarch. So why did Bodhidharma, the patriarch, Need to come from the West if we don't need anything from anybody, as Zen monks and all is one, and one for all in France. Why, then, do we need to think about Paris? Uh, you know, farewell to it, even if it is alive and well in us. And why do we need the Bodhidharma to come from the Indias if we are, in fact, having the Buddhas inside us all along here? Around her. So, Sung Lin said, Sitting for a long time becomes tiresome. This is very much like Mazu. I'm making a mirror out of a tile. Hey, I'm trying to sit and meditate here. Come on. Meditation can be a pain in the tuchus. This is not only uh, this is not the only thing Buddhism means, but funny enough, if you are meditating, one of the things meditation means quite freely is a pain in the rump. 
And that's not all it means, but notice, funny enough, if we're looking at a situation of a situation of many meanings, well, meditation also means you get a pain in your rear. It does. There's nothing wrong with that if you're sitting around for a while. In fact, that doesn't tell you to get a pain in the rear or not, but that's one of the things, again, the true meaning of winter. What is it? Cocoa? Tobogganing? One? Pick one, not the other, exclusively. So it's not the only thing Buddhism means. What did Bodhidharma bring from the West? Well, he brought a sandal, probably another one. Otherwise, that would have gotten tiresome. You know, and it's like, is that the only thing? The one sandal left in the grave? Well, of course not. What are you, some kind of idiot? You know, a sandal only means what it means in living connection with other beings, meaning things with semantics, quite dismissible. Like some dried up sandal, you know, in the grave. So if we can freely float with all of that and float like a butterfly, sting like a stingray, you know, like a Socrates, yeah, you don't really need a sitting for a long time is tiresome. It is. And then you just dis meditation. Chan Dhyana Zen meditating Buddhists sit a great deal. Bodhidharma's lineage means a great deal of things, which includes, in free flow, sitting for a long time becoming quite tiresome quite often. It isn't the single truth of Buddhism, but even the question, what's the single truth of Buddhism, could be interpreted to mean many different things, like seven-pound shirt, weighing seven pounds, now involved with scales and weighing and human processes of judgment all in circuit, like a tree falling in the woods and your ears being there to hear the sound in circuit with the air and everything else, which requires the butterfly flapping its wings and the tornado and everything else. It could be interpreted to mean, what is the single truth of Buddhism right now? And Imazu says, what's the meaning of this moment, pal? For you or, you or whomever you think you are. The question can always be interpreted universally and it can always be interpreted particularly. In the second case... Sui Feng said to the assembly, on, southern, on South Mountain, there's a turtle-nosed snake, which is a strange, unexplained beast. In fact, this would be a somewhat mythical beast here. All of you must go take a look. Now, this is actually, this continues here, but already want to stop and comment. So he tells the assembly... And there's other cases like this of uh, the tree and the guy in the tree with his teeth, which are very much like this. And I like this case in particular for tying things like Poe to Carroll to Wittgenstein. I am very into uh, Edgar Allan Poe, Lewis Carroll, and Ludwig Wittgenstein. And all of those guys like setting people up in fictional circumstances and seeing how emotions are intertwined with words and logic and how all that behavioristically affects us, to put it in a small nutshell of words. So when a guy walks up to you in a bus station, in a Zen uh, hall or otherwise, and he says, on South Mountain, there's a turtle-nosed snake, funny enough, he's already got you in a way where you could be like, I don't want to think about that. Don't think of an elephant, as Lakoff says from this town. And it's like, okay, well, I uh, thanks, no, now I hate you and your image. But you've already given the image to the person, of course. If you say, well, it's terrible, terrible that the other side could be lying, but I'm not sure. Well, of course, you're setting people up to think that the people are lying and you're talking about that specifically. So I will use no art nor politics. Again, uh, Socrates' Daimon says, avoid politics, don't get yourself killed. But you have here, okay, so this is, uh, as somebody's going to quick uh, soon say, this is a dragon staff. Okay, now it sort of is, and I, you can't help it in ancient China or here. In fact, I tell you, in ancient China, this happened. You can't help think that that happened, funny enough, even if I'm lying to you. It turns out, no, <laughs> but I made you think it. So funny enough, there's a turtle no snake, and then he says, all of you here must go take a look. Well, if he's just sewn the image in your mind, funny enough, the simplest thing to think here, again, what's the simplest, stupidest meaning? Just the fact that he says, don't think of an elephant, all of you have to go take a look at an elephant now. Well, yeah, in your mind. Now you have the image of an elephant. Even though I rarely ever have actual elephants in my life in the ever-loving slightest, I have not been to the zoo in a long while, that is shameful i feel uh, well, again unless zoos are shameful and then it's uh i'm a good person in a bad society for not engaging according to confucius himself and he's quite conservative on southern mountain if i say hey there's a turtle nose snake in your head ha ha i'm dancing around i'm between your ears according to joshu where is the truth where's buddha nature i'm between your ears right now watch me dancey dance so again dance magic hat dance hatless peoples 
there's a turtle no snake now in your mind, whether you like it or not, and we're talking about a mystical beast. So funny enough, if I ever want there to be unicorns, I just mention unicorns. I do this all the time. Avicenna, the possibly the greatest of Islamic philosophers, used unicorns as a mythical imaginary beast and says in your mind, he says as a doctor who comes up with uh, terms for dementia and epilepsy, is that he says in your mind you imagine you have a vision of fire and light and platonic shadow puppets, he was a Neoplatonist, that you, and also decent enough Aristotelian, though didn't like Aristotle as much as Averroes, that you have a, a horse plus horn equals unicorn in your mind. There are no real unicorns, he says, but your image of a mystical, mythical beast corresponds. So here, this Zen guy might think there is a turtle nose snake on a southern mountain. He might not think so, but he actually knows, even though he's possibly never seen one, I'd say certainly, he can say, by the way, there's a unicorn. Everyone has to look at a unicorn right now, and he means it. He's right. You all have to sort of see a unicorn in your head, often. Not always. Wittgenstein would say, if I say red, yellow, blue, you don't necessarily see each of those, but you're competent enough to. So technically, if you're prepared for this, you could be all meditating and make sure you don't see something like this. But if you're not prepared for this and somebody says turtle no snake, it might be very hard for your mind to not flow there and see an image of it accidentally. And then he won't care and he'll just go on, uh, go along. All of you have to take a look. Now, that's just the opening lines of this thing. I've already beaten it to death. So Yun Men takes his staff, speaking of which, throws it to the floor and pretends to be terrified of it. Now, and the, here you have, and funny enough, everything again that I would explain at length in the notes, which I've already kind of uh, gone along here, what you have, oddly enough, in this case is there is a guy very subtly saying, when I mention a beast that can't exist, or possibly can, but is a mythical beast that no one gets to see much at all, as soon as I mention this, everyone has to look at it, even though it doesn't exist. Seems to be something you could think here, as well as other things. And then, in response, Yun Men takes his staff, throws it to the floor, and pretends to be terrified of it as if his staff is a snake. Now, that is also, have to mention the Nyaya Sutra, the Nyaya, the Vaisheshika and the Nyaya of the, Hin the Hindu logicians, they mention that your eyes could be wrong about things. Why? Because you could mistake a man for a tree stump in the dark, or you could mistake, and implied sort of in the full light of day without in the dark, they say, a rope for a snake. I have already mentioned there is a famous Indian novel from India called The Snake and the Rope about a man falling in love with a prostitute more than with his wife, which is vicious, but is very novel fodder uh, and became a famous novel, I believe. Again, I got to look up the dates in the 90s or 80s, I think. I have a copy of it. I have not read it. Yeah, like a lot of books I have behind me, I have read some of it. I have not read all of it. It gives a fine impression and face now that I've said that. What the... Uh, when... <laughs> With this example, not only is he forcing people, the first guy, to think about, to see, of course, in their mind, but right now the hallway outside my apartment door is in my mind, but it's very real. So he forces you to look at a unicorn. When I say unicorn, you don't have to think of one. In fact, you might not see one in your head, and I'm still talking. But it's going to be hard for me to not be able to make you sort of see one. In the same way, if I led a real unicorn into a room, it'd be hard for you to not look at it. So then Yun Men takes his staff. Notice the free play here. In fact, I would just comment on that and say these are two masters seeing each other. This is, again, guest meeting up with host for Lin Ji. Both seem to be accomplished, and neither one seems to actually uh, take out the other one in this Dharma combat. They both seem to meet eye to eye and then just pass cynically uh, as ships in the night where the ships can sail because the water's deep enough here. The questioning is the depth of the deep for Joshu. That young man takes his staff. Now you can see the staff. Now this is, again, some somebody quickly here is going to be like, this is now a dragon staff. Whoa, it's magical. Well, because they've called it that, now it signifies that. This is Paris, France. Now it's Paris, France. Well, that's magical, isn't it? I mean, how the heck do I do that with basic semantics and meaning? So, uh, here again, the oak tree and the water glass. So... 
He now takes his staff, throws it to the floor. He's besting the guy kind of, but he's also matching him, but with a slightly different example. The one guy is showing us that you can say, well, tree stump, and now there's a tree stump in your head. And the other guy's like, bam, snay, and he doesn't say a word. The first guy used words. The second guy used a wordless gesture and was frightened of it, which tells us something without words. So you have the first guy showing us something without a visual. The second guy tells us something without words, much like the first guy told us, but without words, which relies on the first guy telling us it in words for the second guy in the situation to weave in wordlessly the feelings, the example, the behavior into the situation without a word, but going like this, which is sort of a word, but more kind of a bodily gesture. You can see the play of it, and these are two Zen guys sort of being like, uh-huh, but they don't need to nod here. They don't even need the gesture. These are all the gesture of the nod to each other itself. That seems to be very much the way that many would read the text. And we would get a hint here if it was that one of these guys is an idiot. They're both acting foolish. Neither guy is necessarily an idiot. When both win in Zen, neither side seems to, it's just sort of like, okay, both were said what? And neither side seems... They both seem foolish, but neither side seems to lose, and that's a win on both sides. I would suggest that. That's also very quite like Taoism, and Taoism has already had a thousand plus years of text, suggesting that is very sage-like to act that way. So Yun Men throws down his staff and pretends it's a snake, imitating uh, or a snake turtle or whatever he's doing. He seems to suggest just the snake, which again would actually even playing on it. It's like, no, I don't even need a med. That's a snake. Oh, no. That snake's a real creature you could even find is another angle here. And yet that's not a snake any more than it's not a snake turtle, which is a beast you cannot actually see outside. Let's think. Which, again, they may or may not know here, but are certainly playing on a turtle snake, something these folks have not really seen, uh, but could. And again, here, it's just like the gods. It's hard to know whether or not the folks believe literally or not here. And they know what literal is and isn't, sort of, but not with our word, quite literally. Yes? As we use and misuse it, and I do too. So... He pretends it's a snake, so he's imitating Sui Feng throwing the words out. So it's very subtle here, but again, these are moves of Zen Buddhism where if you say turtle no snake, you've now thrown out a turtle no snake visually with words. And so here the guy throws down a staff and means something to me and you and spawns words in us and in your head and talking about it by wordlessly throwing down a staff after words. It shows you all the interconnections and it shows you how these guys are thinking very much in the smallest amount of lines. Here again, I don't think that's pulling too much out of too little. I think that at least that can be pulled out of it and would be quite immediate if you stared at it long enough. That would feel, you could feel out if you're feeling for the characters, as Poe advises uh, via Dupont. If you feel this out, guess what? You're going to find it pretty soon. In the 25th case, the Hermit of Lotus Flower Peak, a strange Arhat-like character, Whenever I have to mention arhats and explain them, what are arhats? Well, they sort of evolved in Buddhism over time, but they're kind of random people like the Buddha who are off in the jungle, and they sort of are doing their own thing. It's like the Zhuangzi. There's a bunch of different... There's Joe of the North Sea, who's the well frog guy. And then, who's that? Well, he's a sage in the area at the time. Is he a Taoist? Yes, now he is. Okay, that's unhelpful. But there's just these people all flourishing around at the same time, some outerlying uh, folks. It very much is like, say... Outerlying surrealist painters who happen to be influential, but they're sort of outside the circle. Something sort of like that, I would say, in the history of human thought all over the place in various things. I imagine you would find it in all sorts of circles of talk, art, everything. The inner and outer members, and that's more or less influential, depending. So the Hermit of Lotus Flower Peak, who's this guy? Is he Zen? Well, he's going to wander in and lecture the Zen monastery, so sure. Is, does he have a shaved head or does he have wild hair all over the place? Well, yeah. He wanders in, doing his own thing, held up his staff before the assembly. Here again, we're going to have simple use of examples. And he says, when the ancients got here, why didn't they agree to stay here? Now, he's holding up a staff, which is kind of like the the institution the thing the stand and he says what when they got here why didn't they stay and he has this thing held up in front of everybody sort of implying like here's something nice and for the time being permanent and standing why didn't it stand permanently 
Nobody answered. So he replied, because they gained no strength on the path. Now that is a very tricky, wonderful answer. For a while, especially, I looked at this and I'm like, I really sort of don't get that because you're supposed to gain strength on the path. But over as over the while that I've been rereading these texts and trying to figure out how Taoist they are, it definitely strikes me that one of the ironic things that somebody who's truly wise like Socrates could tell you is, but I'm no wiser than anyone else. And for in, it does remind me often of the parable of Jesus with two pieces of silver. Well, I worked my, you know, my rear off, my took us off for 15 hours longer than that guy. Yes. And you get two pieces of silver. I'm not going to mention what I think of multiple pieces of silver. I think it stands for human emotions, actually, as opposed to reason, which is top and golden and multiple silver as opposed to singular gold. I think that's featured in the first of Poe's detective stories also. Not that this is a universal thing across humankind, but multiple pieces of silver as opposed to something unitive and gold, would suggest something multiple, messy, and secondary. Although some people say the Israelites definitely appreciated silver as a topmost metal, it's also true that many cultures have put silver beneath gold. Plato does, and the Greco-Roman uh, Abrahamic tradition would. So many pieces of silver would signify loose, uh, chaotic emotions as secondary heart kind of beneath the sort of head somewhat, or could easily. And so if you have a bunch of random chaotic emotions for a Taoist or for Jesus or for other people, if everybody's going to have a bunch of random humanness and so you can hang out with prostitutes or lepers or a bunch of holy fools and who cares, then one of the things that you could definitely tell people is that all the practicing of Buddhism, all the polishing of a tile, all the meditation in the universe is not going to give you any more strength than you already have. Because, of course, what you're doing is clarifying the thing you are all along. And if you're clarifying the thing you are all along, as you are on the path, you are gaining no strength on the path. It sounds terrible. Sounds like the whole reason this guy hangs out on Lotus Flower Peak and the whole reason these people are here in a monastery is to gain strength. But if the power was inside you all along, one of the wonderful ways to slap people with words counterintuitively is to say all of the meditation you are doing, all of the work you are doing, all of the merit you're gaining by being good or kind, Bodhidharma says the emperor, all of this merit, all of the temples, all of the copying of texts brings you zero Good day, sir. Why? Because you get your two pieces of silver, you get your multiple emotions, you get your ego, you get your pride, you get kicked in the shins, you get all that, just like every other jerk. That's life. If you don't accept that, what part of Buddhism do you not like? It all fits together very well because if you are focused on gaining something outside you, as we've had with Bodhidharma, Hui Neng, Mazu, jerking you around with your name, being like, what are you being called around for? Because if you don't gain or lose anything, as Hui Meng says after uh, hanging out with Hui Neng on a mountaintop, if I hadn't gone to Hui Neng, how would I have known I don't have anything to gain? Because you gain no strength on the path. It all does fit together very well, although when I first heard that, I was like, Yeesh, you know, that's kind of a real harsh slap in the face, and I don't even know where to end at first. That's depressing. It's like, well, then why even start? Well, if you hadn't even started and been there for years, how would you have even <laughs> have known that, yeah, you actually had it the whole time and didn't even, uh, in a certain sense, needed to start to know, well, in a certain way, you could have not even needed to start. Really doesn't have to do with however long you have to work if you're gaining and clarifying the exact same thing that you always share with others, whether or not they clarify it in themselves or not, and let the monkeys chatter, as Zhuang Tzu says, if they want to. Because all that for the Taoist is part of life, not to be extinguished or clarified. All the Buddhist texts, bunch of wild grass, never been cut for Lin Ji. Because it's a bunch of loose pieces of silver. Because it's a bunch of emotion. So, he says they gain no strength on the path. I'm again pausing each line because there's just so much in each line. He then says, in the end, how is it? Now, here again, if it is at all what I've been saying, then in the end, it, well, it's going to be just, I mean, in the end, it's exactly like it is now. So, you, that's already set up for that. So, he says, in the end, how is it? As with good interpretation, if the thing following it makes some sense 
and doesn't until you actually make sense of this thing. Of course, you could be interpreting everything like Hitler, as he says in Mein Kampf. Suddenly, I realize the Jews are behind everything. Everywhere I look, well, if he had looked harder, hopefully he wouldn't have seen all of that nonsense. So, basically, of course, if you're looking around, you're seeing everything everywhere. Maybe you're fooling yourself. But... If in an, in an interpretation, if the thing following it actually didn't make sense and now does, maybe, again, hopefully, that's something better than Hitlerific with all of this. But if you gain no strength on the path, then in the end, how is it? Well, that already sets up itself to be the interpretation. Well, then it's the same as right now. No one answers. They're not smart enough. They're not as good in the monastery as the random hermit from Lotus Flower Peak. This is a very Mahayana text. Because a random guy on a peak is just as smart as the folks in the monastery, like an old Indian arhat. Nobody answered because they're dumb. At least they don't talk. So he says, with my staff across my shoulders, I pay no heed to people. I go straight into the endless mountains. A little bit of Twin Peaks. A little bit of endless emotional struggle with folks. But if you in the end are accepting plenty, well, you are so somewhat the whole entire time as well. And again, notice, in the end, how is it? Picking up, uh, starting into the hills with the effort. There is a very similar uh, Zen tale mentioned with um, Budai, Hotei, the fat, laughing Buddha. There's a Zen-like tale told of him, probably evolved around the same time in China, which it said, what is the meaning of Zen? And he takes his bag of treats for children and drops it on the ground. And then is, when asked, so how do we put it into practice? He picks up the bag and he just walks away. With my staff across my shoulders, I pay no heed to people. I go straight into the endless mountains because it's another day of work. Gotta go to work. You know, it's like, well, how is it to practice then? Gotta go to work, drink some coffee, deal with jerks, you know, another day. Because of course, if you are getting it, you're not rejecting anything. And it's tricky words because like holding up a fist twice for Joshu, and the end of the Illuminati is that it basically is like, yeah, you hold up a fist twice, it's the same thing, but it's totally different and it's fluid and it's all of that all together, like the silent transmission and the dead empty words and sandal. This is the point again. I took my time through everything such that I can just wind crazy style through all of this because again, you can see the pieces with the Taoism and the Buddhism and then Chan Buddhism falling very much into place such that if you were in a monastery reading all of these texts and you had to a lot, Taoist texts and Buddhist texts, you would have a lot of the context for how you could spontaneously crack into very simple symbolism as well as then apl apply those profound ideas to all sorts of things in life in new and flexible, poetic, and meaningful, serious ways. In the 31st case, Mazu went to Zhang Jing's place circled Zhang Jing, sitting in the central meditation seat three times, there are three circles overall in Buddhist cosmology, and shook his ringed staff once and took a proud stand. Here again, we have a temporary stand standing proudly like the self, tallest thing in the cosmos for Bodhidharma, but of course all selves and things are temporary even as they stand tall in the three-ringed circus of the cosmos. For any fan of Japanese culture or anime, the, Kaka, uh, the Kakara staff, known in China as the Si Zhang, the tin stick, and in Japan as the Shakujo, is the, a staff for traveling Buddhist monks topped with several jangling metal rings that scare away ghosts and demons, warn animals, as well as ghosts and demons, which are quite bestial and demonic, so the animals won't be surprised and scared. I have a wooden hiking stick I got from my grandfather, which uh, actually has a jangly wooden thing, which is kind of annoying jangling off it. You can't figure it. It's hard to hold it without that thing jangling around on it, but it's to scare away bears here in sunny California with lots of bears on the flag again. So got to be scared, you know, of well of the flag and the bear, etc. It's uh, yes. So, jangling metal things on the top of stabs here that scare away ghosts and demons and call out to people who need help and teachings. By circling three times and shaking uh, his staff, Maku is likely taking a protective and compassionate stand in the name of Buddhism and all conscious beings in the face of endless circles of birth, existence, and death. That's a nice number three, isn't it? The number three used by many cultures to signify endlessness. -ness. 
Yes. So yes. And yes, and yes, and yes, and yes, and yes, and yes. Yeah. There goes Mary Tyler Moore off into the wild blue yonder, thwonk, you know, upward with all of that. So Maku seems to be imitating Buddhism or the individual or anything itself. And again, this is a dragon staff. So this is Buddhism. This is Joshu. So already we've had enough context now. What is he saying? So he could be saying all that, none of that. So how is the guy going to respond? Zhang Jing said, correct, correct. This is a bit like the fist held up twice. Maku went to Nanchuan's place. Guess what? Before that fist was held up twice, Nanchuan, here in the 31st case, uh, Joshu's master, Nansen, is the second guy here. Maku went to Nansen's place, master of Zhaoshou, and did the same. He circles around three times. Chunk with the staff. I'm standing here. Nansen said, wrong, wrong. Joshu is asked, what's a perfect question? Wrong. And he also is holds up, holds up the, sta uh, the fist twice. First time, bad. Second time, all right, good. And he bows to the guy. This is the reverse order. Same thing, complex fist hold up. Good, good. Second time, bad, bad, wrong, wrong. Maku says to Joshu's master who said wrong to the question, he says, Zhang Jing said, correct. Why do you say wrong? And Nanchuan said, Zhang Jing is correct. It is you who are wrong. This is what is turned about by the power of wind, he says. Wind is signified with breath and other things. It gets heated up by the heart and the emotions and all of that and the mind and the uh, thoughts and all that. But yeah, is breath and words. This is what is turned about turning words by the power of wind. In the end, it breaks down and disintegrates. Well, he ended negative on the stand, so in the end, it breaks down and disintegrates. Well, that's true of each and every stand and could have been implied. Now, this is a very complex play on the double fist thing, and the fist twice here seems to be a very simplified version that came about later of this thing. Because actually you have two masters who are like two fists, one right, one wrong. One says right, right, the other wrong, wrong. That's like two masters twice, like an inversion of the fist twice because it's uh, twice of the same, but then inverted, right, right, wrong, wrong. And if these are two masters who are like each other, it's the guy who says, wait a minute, why is one right and the other wrong? Well, if he had, <laughs> funny enough, he had everything from the beginning, if we're understanding him the way I'm explaining it somewhat. That when he takes a stand, it's good, it's bad, it's the ugly, it's going to stand, it's not going to stand. As uh, Nonsense says in the end of the koan, well, the stand, it breaks down. So right, right, wrong, wrong, of course, it's right and it's wrong. You're going to be wrong in every case, Linji says. And Linji, again, is the student of Nonsense cohort in... Of, uh, of Nonsense cohort in the house of Huang Bo... But anyway, I mix up my lineages again, and I've been saying too much. So in the end, it breaks down and disintegrates. Let's go on to the 52nd case. So in the 52nd case, a monk says to Joshu, for a long time, I've heard of the stone bridge of Joshu, Zhaosho, stone bridge. I've heard of the stone bridge, a stone bridge already. But now that I've come here, I see just a simple log bridge. Now what, of course, by the way, we had Zhao uh, Zhao Zhou Zhu goes to the two guys on Mount Tiantai uh, and, and Kito Ju. Um, uh, and G, uh, I'm going to mix up their names. And he says, I just see two water buffalo. This guy comes here. Maybe he's heard of that case. Maybe it's before it. But he comes here and he says to people who've heard that case before. So I just see a simple log bridge here. And Joshu says, you just see the log bridge. You don't see the stone bridge. The monk says, what is the stone bridge? And Joshu says, it lets foolish donkeys cross and lets fine horses cross. Which think about the plays of that, given everything we've said. The way allows for fools and the wise both cross through it equally. So there's fools and the wise. Now, did he pick and choose and say the wise aren't the foolish? He didn't. In fact, in using words, he might have picked or chose, or he might not have. This is exactly the kind of language, and I do love logic and inclusive and exclusive or. Technically, with inclusive and exclusive or, 
When you said it lets fools cross and lets the wise cross, that doesn't tell you whether you're talking about the same set of the fools and the wise or two different sets exclusively of the wise aren't foolish and the foolish aren't wise. And that's exactly the sort of play on, do you know that as wise as you are, you're stupid and a fool and can see that, knowing the unknown and seeing the foolish in yourself and others, where he doesn't have to pick and choose between him, Linji, Puhua, as to who's the donkey. He's left the language open, but it does seem like he is picking and choosing with the language. Or at least we could be tempted to think so. This is a very fine play on not picking and choosing while picking and choosing and using words, and yet not picking and choosing beyond the words could very well be felt out right here. That, again, is a very simple case, quite awesome. I keep mentioning mentioning the dragon staff, and here it is. In the 60th case, young men held again, held up his staff in front of the assembly and said, this staff has changed into a dragon and has swallowed up the entire universe. Let's put this again. So here's a finger, right? So I'm holding this up in front of your face, and in an earlier case, we had something like, all of you have to go look at the imaginary creature I'm holding up in front of your face. And then you had a guy drop a staff in front of everybody and act like this is a snake. Oh, no. So he holds up his staff in front of everybody and he says, this staff has changed into a dragon and it has swallowed up the entire universe. Well, look at me. And then if I, you're listening to me talk and looking at my finger, now look at everything behind me. Now look at me, and you'll notice that I am swallowing up and not swallowing up stuff as you look at me and you don't. So this swallows up everything else when you look at it with your focus of attention. It's a dragon, om nom nom, swallows up, oh no, om nom 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 nom. Now here it is, It's pay, you're paying attention to it, not to me, oh no. Well, look beyond the finger at me, and now, you know, look beyond me and the finger at everything going on behind me. By the way, for the Taoists, I need each and every square of inch I'm not standing on in the earth in order to interconnect such that the earth beneath my feet and the Zhuangzi text is meaningful. So right now, this is a dragon, om nom 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 nom, gobbles up everything it's actually dependent on, my feet, but I would say my big toes, in the universe. And it does so so simply. And that is the universe again, uh, interacting with others. I thought, <laughs> I do have my ringer off. I must have my email open. I do. Well, there's the interconnection of the universe for you. Sorry about that. So, um, here we have the, uh, which of course that pulled my mind completely out of the lecture, didn't it? This is the dragon. There's a phone. This is the dragon phone. So, young men, the magician, can make the universe disappear simply by holding up a single thing. Even when reading about the stick young men talked about over a thousand years ago, even you watching that phone call, you can lose sight of everything else in the situation. That's what the focus of attention does. It doesn't and it does and it doesn't, and we have to deal with its jerkness and its stand all day. And there's a bit of pride and ego in the attention span and every move we make, every breath we take, whether or not we're watching us or somebody else, you know, or that constitutes stalking and or assault. So, which is mental, physical, all of it. So, young men pulls mountains, he says, this has swallowed up the entire universe. Where do mountains, rivers, and the wide earth come from? And that's it. Now, that's actually very awesome because insofar as this swallows up everything, Notice the play going on here, and as with philosophy, in order to do thought experiments or koan cases, you don't need any lab materials. It's nice to have a finger, as uh, Gotei may or may not object to. We're going to get to uh, in a little bit. With the Zen stories. I do need to do another talk on the major Zen stories, actually. So he says, as he's like, this is a staff that is a dragon swallowing everything up. Now listen to his words. As he holds it up, he says, where do mountains, rivers, and the wide earth come from? Well, oddly enough, that's almost now like out of this one dragon thing or this one finger. I'm telling you a lot of things that you can't help but see in your mind. Again, now we have back here the snake turtle which is a good way of referring to I've planted a how don't think of an elephant in your head. So here we have the snake turtle. Where do a bunch of I, what is the, what is the, where is the way? And Joshu says, I wove together a seven uh, shirt, a hemp shirt. It weighed seven pounds. 
You have something like, this is a dragon, where do a bunch of A, B, C, and D come from? I have no idea. You know, well, it comes out of this and out of my words, and as you're paying attention to this, I'm saying a bunch of words, and now you have a bunch of things in your head as well as this. In other words, here's a dragon swallows up everything A, B, C, D, and E. Well, now A, B, C, D, and E are swallowing up this while this remains right in front of your face. Isn't that awesome? That again is the simple sort of thing you're supposed to feel out if you are slowly paying attention to these things. And again, anybody giving you something more complicated than that, they're probably overthinking it, and then there would be probably simpler things here that I am straight up missing and looking and feeling past. Because it would have to snap for anybody else looking at it while you're thinking and feeling through it. Otherwise, it doesn't feel like the objective collective truth plenty. It feels like your subjective perspective or playing with that back and forth and getting a wider, wiser perspective on that. So Yun Men is pulling mountains, rivers, and the entire earth out of his hat, out of his head, putting it into ours, and no one spoke of the mighty dragon stick again. Unless we can help it. So the 77th case is cake. A monk asked Yun Men, what is talk that goes beyond Buddhas and patriarchs? And Yun Men said, cake. This actually could be rice cake or cake, and I don't know whether or not this is sweet. I'm not sure, actually. But either way, you're actually bringing to mind texture, sweetness, touch, satisfaction, all sorts of things with a single word, which is not cake, and you cannot eat the word. Can't live by the mere words alone, but by bread, etc. It's a strange ghost that can be raised with a single word, and yet cake is a lot more real in one's life and rice uh, than a snake turtle, mythical being. But it isn't. In the 80th case, a monk asked, does a newborn baby have all six kinds of mind? This is a great other Joshu quote. Once again, notice how much Joshu is throughout all of this. Of course, I picked these cases. How'd that happen? Joshu said, it is like throwing a ball into the swift rapids. When I do read uh, Lakoff and Johnson and Philosophy in the Flesh, I do think to myself, can these things all be categorized in 15 stages, or is it like a ball being thrown into the swift rapids as we or the infant acquire all six kinds of mind right here? And enough words. So is Zhao Zhou referring to the mind of the baby, his own mind seeking an answer, or the mind of the monk who is asking the question? Well, anyway, you cut it. Trying to figure out which of these ourselves is like the ball, uh, like some sort of thing in some sort of swift moving water. And notice that does mean, does the baby already have six faculties, uh, which is very psychology in modern speak. Again, a lot of psychologists like Buddhism, especially out here in California. IA. In the 81st case, nine by nine, a monk says, uh, out of 10 cases, 10 by 10, on the grassy plain, there are deer large and small. This is a good one. This is also a complicated one, way simple, way confusing. But if you talk through it slowly, as with all of this stuff, what I'm going to argue is if you talk through it slowly and feel it out, you can actually get very clear, easy, weird answers. And that will like you're sitting, paying attention to it for years. In the 81st case, a monk says, on the grassy plain, there are deer large and small. Now, large deer, large usually means more meaningful or more close up. Small means more insignificant or less weighty, usually. How can I shoot the greatest deer of all? What's the meaning of Buddhism? Is a tricky way of somewhat saying it. How do I get the big important meaning here and the big weighty deer here? Where's the beef and or the venison? Yao Shan said, look, an arrow, which implies that the monk is trying to hunt and trying to get the big, it's like a, trying to grasp a pillow in back of one's head in the night. Uh, look, an arrow, an attempt to grasp this whole thing, a shot. The monk fell to the floor as if dead. Yao Shan says, attendant, drag this dead fellow out of here. And the monk leaps up and runs out. Yao Shan said, how long will this fellow play with a mud ball? And that's the end of it, which actually I would suggest it does sound like Lin Ji. You're not my problem. Get out of here, you. Sounds like actually this nameless monk, he decently wins. And he decently wins because he ran out of there before he could get struck in the app or anything like that. But the funny thing is, look at check out the simple play of this. It's amazing. And in fact, I stared at this one definitely and was like, what? And again, feeling it slowly out. Thinking about what we've talked about, you can see some of the play here that's possible. That's possible. And as Poe says, it's possibility that's more brilliant than certainty. Is more meaningful, more weighty, oddly enough. So Yao Shan says, let's pick back up here. Look, an arrow, a shot at the biggest deer. 
the monk falls to the floor. Now, that's funny because Yao Shan did not say, look, you shot an arrow at me, although that's certainly implied, isn't it? But it's not spoken. So what did the monk do? The monk acts as if Yao Shan is the one who shot the arrow, not himself. Now, there's nothing the master can do about this, really. Uh, he can do all kinds of things. But technically, the master's words leave it open as to, and in fact, the human mind leaves it open as to, whether or not it is the student or the master who is trying to shoot the larger deer. So he just falls freely as if he's dead, even though he's a living being, playing, acting, and being dead. Now, this could be actually like he is the deer, of course. He acts like, I'm the deer, I'm the big meaning here, you're not, which is like Linji slapping his master. Oh, you took a shot, you're the student, or I'm the master, or I'm the deer, or I don't know, and you took a shot at me instead of me taking a shot at you, which your words did not say otherwise. Yao Shan says, attendant, drag this dead now, Yao Shan. It's like, is there a tiger around here? Rawr, pretend to be a tiger. Yao Shan says, how long? He says, get this, get, he follows the dead guy into his act. He says, get this dead body out of here. And the monk leaps up and runs out. Now, when he says, get this dead body out of here, the guy could be. And it's like, what's the easiest thing to feel is the comedy. Now it's weird. It's like, what is going on? He runs out of the room. Once again, what's the easiest thing? If he is play acting at any role in the situation, he could be a deer running away. He could be the attendant running into the room or out of the room, but into the room by running out like Joshu because he's coming to get the dead body as the attendant, as if now he's acting like he is the attendant called. But it also makes sense in a very stupid way. As soon as he says, get this dead body out of here, ah, a dead body, and he runs away. Why is that an easy interpretation? Because we had, oh no, my staff is a snake. And the staff is a dead image or a dead uh, object, like a sandal in Bodhidharma's grave. So one of the easiest things is this guy's like, dead body? I'm out of here. I'm not screwing around with dead things. I'm not going to be caught by the cops near a dead body. Yeesh. And he runs away. Thief. Thief. Oh, no, the cops. There's an easy play. There's a dead body. There's a dead body. I am either scared of dead bodies or I don't want to be caught as a murderer. I am out of here. Well, this is a guy who dropped to the floor as a dead body. Thief. Murderer. There's a dead body here. I'm not going to be caught dead with that. I'm out, even though he was the dead body imitating the dead body. There's a dead body. <laughs> You're not going to see me. How Grojo Marx ridiculous is this? But again, what's the simplest, stupidest way of reading it? Uh, this is another one. As the first couple of times I read it, I was like, this is just, are they just trying to screw with me? And too many people are like, they're just trying to screw with you. All you got to do is just slowly feel it out. And I, again, expect there to be more here I'm missing. But when you say there's a dead body and somebody runs away, what's the first thing you can think? Well, it's hard to understand because the guy was the dead body itself. But if we are thinking, oh, you're free playing in the situation, just acting like a crazy person who can't tell one thing from another, there's a dead body here. If somebody runs out, the first thing you would think is he's running away from the dead body. But you wouldn't think that if he is the dead body. It's a lot like, again, a lot of the examples we've already had. Here again, could be right or wrong altogether. You will be wrong in every case, Linji says, so don't worry about it. Here again, if somebody's like, that's just very wrong or not reverent enough, I don't think any of these guys are worried about me being very wrong or you being very wrong and have, taking license of mind here. No, they're not. So if, at worst, this means a lot more than what I'm saying, and plenty means that. You know, I can say that with confidence because, again, they would want you to be so brash and stupid about meaning, you just slop it all around like that. That's exactly what they are doing. And Yao Shan says, how long will this fellow play with a mud ball, this bunch of chaos, this bunch of a mess? Well, playing with this bunch of a mess, this mud ball, is our time on Earth here for a bit before we fall to the earth dead like a fake deer shot with a fake arrow. So, hey, let's play with life and play act of being alive and dead already, like two dueling oxen who both act the same. I didn't make enough out of that duality either, but they appear in ways where they act the same as a pair, the dueling uh, water oxen, etc. in the previous Joshu talks. So the monk asks a violent question in tune with the Song of Linji, possibly about the greatest when Yao Shan says there's an arrow. 
about the greatest. When Yao Shan says there's an arrow, he could be talking about the monk's question, or he could be talking about calling attention to the monk's question by saying there's an arrow himself. You could only consider the second thought after considering the first, and the monk sees both, which is why he plays along and falls to the floor as if dead, acting as if Yao Shan's statement is the arrow aimed at him. Yao Shan plays along with the monk and asks if somebody can drag him out, and then he the monk plays along with Yao Shan. Oh no, there's a dead body. And he runs out of the room, which is playing along and not playing along like the water oxen the whole dang time. That is again, brilliant. At least I'm going to take it that way like a fool. So in the 85th case, we are going on an hour here. We are going to talk about the 85th, the 89th, the 94th, and the 98th case. And actually mention the 100th case just to top it off. So we're just going to power through rather than start another talk and a shorter one here. So in the 85th case, a monk came to the hermit Tong Feng and asked, what if you were suddenly face to face with a tiger out here? We already had this case, actually. We covered it. And Tong Feng roars like a tiger. This is thus. Actually, uh, we already covered it in the talks, given that I was actually intuiting it and then forgot that this is in the notes right here. That tiger case, which seems very related here, ha actually happens to be reprinted and compiled in the same text nearby. Let's just say there's an imaginary tiger lurking in the area, in our minds. Again, I do like Don't Sleep, There Are Snakes, and in watching YouTube videos of Amazonians, which I highly recommend, go watch Amazonians who don't have any math or literacy in their lives, act like normal people, without the institutions of science, religion, art, pretty much anything. And this one guy's like, yeah, Jaguar ate my grandmother. You know, got her in the neck, dragged her off. Hopefully she got a couple in, though. You know, is not what he said. I would have loved that. And he probably loves his grandma, you know. It's like, well, heck. And in the uh, Don't Sleep There Are Snakes book about uh, by Everett uh, about the Amazonians, you have a similar play here if I have not worked this into the talk. If I have my, my the talks on Zen, my apologies. But I was thinking the other day of there's a kid who is... Uh, who is um, annoyed by his grandmother. She's telling him to do something. The kid doesn't like it. So he goes into his Amazonian dad, Amazonian dad. If you study really hard, you're not going to be a doctor or a lawyer. What the heck is any of that? So we don't have institutions here. Am I right? Who wants to live in an institution? Groucho Marx, you know, and the kid says, dad, grandma's, you know, annoying me. And she wants me to go take a nap or something. And dad's like, well, let's kill grandma. And the kid's like, no. And he goes and he's like, grandma. And he goes and he loves grandma. And the cat's like, you stupid kid. Now back to the cave wall, you know, with Bodhidharma. So it's like back to whittling a stick, you know. All right, serious work here. Is that, of course, these are smart, awesome people. They have human brains and lives just like you and I do. So when he's like, let's kill grandma, it's easy to be like, this savage, this beast. Of course, he doesn't want to kill grandma. You'd be a real uh, crappy tribe if you did. Because, of course, he's joking. And we can feel he's joking if we fill it out. Because, of course, these guys and the guy who's like, well, Jaguar got my grandma, totaled my car. He very much feels for his grandma, but what are you going to do? You know, it's that that's what life is, you know, all the time, such that somebody could very easily misinterpret uh, these folks. As Dan Everett says, it's marvelous with the Zen stuff, is he starts freaking out as his daughter gets sick. He's like, I need a hospital. They're like, you need to be a man. be uh, Keep yourself together in the last moments of your child's life for your kid so that they have a peaceful death, and then we're just going to bury your kid in the river. What's a hospital? You know, well, it's a large uh, it's a large building full of patients, Shirley, but that's not important right now, and stop calling me Shirley. You know, is it, I don't know why you're freaking out, you know, uh, while your kid's dying, but I don't know what a hospital it is, but just keep it together and we can bury your kid in the river, okay? You can have another one. I mean, you love your kid. Of course you do. So yeah, Jaguar got my grandmother. That's a very similar to the kind of attitudes. I, While I'm reading that book, I can't help but think of all this zen. Of course, you get slapped in the yapper. The guy falls down dead. It's like, well, kids die. You know, here's a dead deer. Thonk. You know, now I'm up and I'm a dead deer. Oh, no. And you run out the room, you know. It's a lot of plays on life and death. But Ty says when we see somebody Pratt fall in a comedy, in black and white uh, comedy with, hey, whoop, 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 you know, we're laughing at death because a Pratt fall and uh, comedy is symbolic of death and our fears are actually our fears. And then there's symbols also. In the 89th case, Yun Yen asks Dao Wu, what does the Bodhisattva of compassion need so many hands and eyes for? What does a Balaki Shivara, God bless you, Gesundheit, what does, uh, if love, now this is a tricky play also. Here's another interesting. This is the head with the pillow in the night. I was mentioning that. So it's only appropriate. Yeah, this happens to be in the same book. 
the same scrolls here. What does the Bodhisattva of love and compassion need so many hands and eyes for? I mean, I know that love's in everybody, so that's symbolized by all the hands and eyes, am I right? But at the same time, I mean, if love is one and all and all for one, then why does it need so many hands and eyes if it's everything? Parmenides asked Plato, if there's one form of a horse, does it touch different horses at different parts of the form, or does it touch it all in the same place? And Plato's like, eh, Socrates, I don't like any of this. Please stop talking. Because there should be just one form of a horse. It can't touch horses in different places. Ew. Like, what the heck is all of that? What does the Bodhisattva, what does the goddess of love and compassion need tons of hands and eyes for? Isn't she all one and one all and in everybody? Doesn't need to touch anything. And Dawu says, it is like someone groping behind their head for a pillow in the middle of the night. What is the one meaning of Buddhism? To the end of time, Joshu says, you will never single out the, respons the fact you are responsible for. What is the true meaning of Buddhism? Why did Bodhidharma come from the West? Why is this just a stand temporary? And then you have ego, and it wilts and it dies and fall, prat fall to the floor with the deer. Well, why does oneness need so many manyness? It's kind of like, as you ask me that, like trying to grab oneness and not being able to grab it and it involving a pillow in your head in the middle of the night and a seven pound shirt weighing a bunch of poundage because, of course, it is a bunch of stuff intermixed with things oneness always is. Where's oneness itself? Well, it's everything. And where is it in particular? Well, it isn't in anything in particular because what's oneness not in the hand or not in the finger or not in the mind? Yun Yin says, I understand, like he's grasped it all together. Dao Wu says, how do you understand it? Which suggests there's many ways of understanding it, like many to one once again. Yun Yin says, the body is covered with hands and eyes. The oneness is the manyness. Dao Wu said, you have said quite a bit there, but only four fifths of it. Now, four-fifths of it would be symbolic. If I have my head and I have my four limbs, yes, I'm like, do-do-do-do-do, then four-fifths of it definitely sounds like, maybe I'm talking about my left arm cut off, but four-fifths of it seems like I'm missing the head. It's a bit acephalous, like Bataille's uh, journal for the outer lying surrealists. Headless. Uh... The body is covered with hands and eyes. He says, you've only said four-fifths of it. You haven't given the head of it, which would be... If we're talking about the head, you haven't given the one to the many. Oh, the one is many, but you haven't given that. It's just, let me flip it back on its head. Yun Yen says, how would you say it, elder brother? Okay, I'm trying to flip with you here. We can see the motions of one to many to many to one complexly. Okay, fine. You got me. How would you say it, elder brother, better? Dao Wu said, throughout the body are hands and eyes. Think about the transition between the body is covered with hands and eyes. And Dawu is saying, no, 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 no. That's not the head beyond the arms and the limbs. The oneness, this is very much the oneness of King Melinda and the chariot and Plato's chariot a little bit as the, with the cross-cultural comparisons. The body, the oneness, is covered with manyness. No, 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 no. That's not the oneness of the manyness. That's not the head and the four, that's the limbs, the four fifths of the rest. How would you say it, elder brother, as the head, as head elder person? I would say that the entire oneness is nothing but manyness itself. And that is the oneness of the manyness. That's very much what it suggests. It's quite subtly there, but it's very there, back and forth. In fact, again, this is a very confusing dialogue unless you're paying attention for simple things and simple feelings like oneness to manyness like that. And then the patterns of it fall into line very well. I think that is, again, sort of the duck rabbit one is looking for here, and you would get it by empathy and feeling out and using empathy and feeling with logic, which is a topic I'm all about. But we're going on in minutes, so let's cover the 94th, 98th, and 100th final case. In the 94th case, the text quotes uh, Surangama, the Surangama Sutra, a Buddhist text these guys read, which seems like an original Indian Mahayana text. I'd have to look it up, honestly, but I'm willing to throw darts at it and bet that that is a Indian Mahayana text like the Lankavatara Sutra. The text just quotes the sutra. This is odd also. Because this is not a back and forth between two people or any Zen monks. This is just quoting an Indian text, and a quote from an Indian text shows up as the 94th case. That is odd and outlying. It says, quote, When I do not see, why do you not see my not seeing? If you see my not seeing, 
that is obviously not simply not seeing. If you don't see my not seeing, then it obviously isn't anything. How can this not be yourself? I have wonderful Wittgensteinian answers to that, and I've been somewhat weaving them together the entire time. But I will leave that somewhat open, especially as we're going on the time here, and say Hakuin of Japan plays on that kind of thing with his uh, blind men on the log bridge. Because he does say, and it is, I will simply leave this with, if you are seeing and hearing and tasting and touching reality and it's all interwoven as the same thing, and if you're imagining and sensing and speaking and understanding reality altogether interwoven as the same thing, then when you see blind men on a log bridge in a painting and just see that, you can see blind men not seeing because when you see a painting, you're actually feeling it and seeing it and even hearing people in your mind occasionally, uh, hopefully not too often. So it would be everything interwoven would be the visual experience as well as a seeing, hearing, feeling experience, which is the only way you could feel for blind men groping their way along a slippery log bridge because it feels more dangerous for blind guys who can't see to be on a log bridge. So you would feel partly as well as see, as well as not see, and in not seeing and in feeling represent the blind men on the log bridge as Hakuin does visually. That again, complex play, hard to follow, so simple in the interweaving, they're asking you to pay subtle attention to how your experience is one and many interwoven. So when I do not see, watch this. So I wasn't looking at my camera right then. How do you know that? Well, because you've seen and felt and smelled and tasted and understood and dreamed lots, which means when I do this, you can see that I'm not seeing things, which involves understanding and semantics, which is seeing interwoven with everything else, touch, taste, imagination, etc. As you imagining, if I go like this, Oh, look at that over there. You have to imagine what I'm, uh, I've just presented you with a, a duck, a duck turtle, a duck rabbit, a turtle snake, more just as or more impossible than the duck rabbit, which is an actual image in our lives. And I go, hey, look at that. And you're not seeing something that you think that I see. And the mind weaves it together so quickly that you've just seen something you haven't seen in a sense, in a way of saying it. Because you see me go like this, but you don't see that. And so you just see me seeing something you don't see. Because it's not just seeing. The words say seeing, but the words say more than they say. Because there's feeling, seeing, hearing, all of that interwoven together by the same mind we all share. Which is how I can confidently share such examples with gestures and words with you. And it can make any sense to you at all. Notice how immediate that is, and how they want you to deepen yourself slowly, bucket fills drop by drop in your ability to do that. That, to me, seems the best of all of this. And again, I use those techniques and actually everything. Don't claim to be specifically Zen, but that's what I get out of that, and so that's what I share with you fine people who I cannot see, but I don't need to. So the 94th case, we have that quote. How can this not be yourself? Well, because your individual self is interwoven out of many things, that's teachings of the Buddha originally. That's codependent arising and everything else. As yourself, which you don't extinguish, you could rearrange or rethink or and think through as interweaving. Get around it. In the 98th case, Tian Ping was traveling around and dropped in on Siu Yan, who would often claim that he could not find anyone who could quote a single saying of the true Buddhist teaching. Well, that's kind of a pun, if you get what I was just talking about. Of course, nobody could fully quote it, or they could, and then you'd say yes, or they'd quote it the same words, and then you'd say no, because they can quote it somewhat and not. So you just act either way and see how they respond, like holding up a fist twice, but reversed. See, Yuan saw Ping coming and called out his name. This is Mazu. Ping raised his head, which is at least acting like he's stupid. And Sui Yuan said wrong, much as Zhao Zhou did when he asked, what a per what's a perfect question? Ping took three steps towards Si Yuan and stopped. Again, Si Yuan said wrong. This is like the previous case. Ping approached and Si Yuan asked him, these two wrongs just now, were they your wrongs or my wrongs? 
as I'm talking about this stuff and I haven't explained it yet, are these my wrongs or are they yours, the audience's wrongs that are going on right here? We share them and we can go different directions on them, even here as we feel it all out, interweave it in our minds and understand it. Yes? With my words. Ping said, my wrongs. Si Yuan said, wrong. Of course. Later, Ping told the monks in his temple, I did not say it was wrong then, but I already knew this was wrong when I set out for the south. Well, of course he did, if you're wrong in every case. He could have set out for the north and it would have been the same. So funny enough, oh, because I particularly set out for the south. Well, you, the whether or not you're going south here, pal, or left at Albuquerque, you'd be wrong in any case, even if you went southwest by Albuquerque. So who cares? Well, they can care one way, care another way. That's life. In the final hundredth case, a monk asked, what is the sharpest sword? And Ba Ling said, the moon sits on each branch of coral. Now that is a oneness and a manyness right there. The sharpest sword could be a sunbeam from above, but very much like a Taoist. The Blue Cliff record concludes, you had the hands and eyes for and the, and the multi-armed bodhisattva of w compassion, a lady person, the moon sits on each and branch, each and every branch of coral. Where are branches of coral? In the depth of the ocean at the very bottom. Yeah. Well, I'm no oceanographer, but I'm hoping there's coral at the bottom of the ocean and that it's not just in the tropical, you know, short, <laughs> shallow waters. But then again, I'll be wrong in every case, especially if I'm trying to be some kind of ichthyologist. So whether or not coral or fish or fish or coral, or they all are interdependent in some kind of ecosystem... Those are the great cases of the Blue Cliff Record. Hopefully you enjoyed all of that. Again, that is me flashing the sword of uh, wisdom as best I can, which is merely the moon and uh, compassion and, and various emotions of our understandings interwoven with all our minds being smart enough, sitting down below deep, deep in the depth of the deep on each and every random branch of coral, every rock in the bottom of the ocean, as stupid and beautiful as all that is. And I will see you all if I ever see you. But again, as I keep mentioning, I do not need to.